Good morning, everyone. Um, as Piers said, my name is Rose Bretichet. Um, I'm a writer and author and creative director and also sometime OCD advocate. Um, it's actually a miracle that I'm here this morning because at 9.05 I was still in bed having missed my alarm. So I've come over from the other side of London in uh, 50 minutes somehow, showered and a face full of makeup. So uh, yeah, I'm quite pleased with myself. <laughs> um, when I was 15 years old, I started experiencing distressing, intrusive thoughts about child abuse. Sometimes the thoughts were mental images of kids being abused. Sometimes they were repetitive sentences which said things like, you're a terrible person, you're evil, you're going to go to prison for, th for thinking these thoughts. And the more I tried to get these words and images out of my head, the more repetitive they became and the more anxiety I experienced. It was a physical sensation of breathlessness coupled with a kind of emotional doom. I remember the intensity of the guilt very distinctly and there's only one thing that I've ever been able to compare it to and that was, it was like I'd killed somebody and I had a body <laughs> buried in the garden and that it could get discovered at any moment. Um, I was also experiencing general intrusive sexual thoughts that were often inappropriate and always unwanted about my friends, about my family members, and by the time I was in my late teens, these thoughts were making me question my sexual identity like a thousand times a day, 24-7. And I was having the thoughts like, um, if I'm having intrusive sexual thoughts about women, how can I be with men? And the more I questioned, the more doubt became a feature of my life. And it led to searing anxiety, self-harm, medication, failed relationships, and suicidal feelings. I didn't know what was going on, of course. I grew up in the Midlands. Um, we're talking, well, it started in 2001. There wasn't much information out there. Um, and I was deeply ashamed and deeply afraid. I thought I was the only person in the world to have ever experienced these things. And I hoped that if I just tried to bury them, just tried to forget about them, that the thoughts would go away. And the years passed, and they only seemed to get worse. And I remember thinking, this can't possibly go on much longer. Um, yeah, it's funny how the years pass when you've got OCD. Um, my intrusive thoughts started when I was 15, and I didn't find out I had OCD until I was in my early 20s. Um, even when I did find that out by reading a medical article online, a massive part of me just couldn't believe it. This new knowledge played into my OCD. I started obsessing about whether or not I did actually have a condition, or whether or not I was just making it up because I couldn't accept who I was. And um, if I'm honest, that, <laughs> that obsession never really went away. That's something that, um, that I still deal with today. And all the while, when all this was happening, this inner storm, I kept it secret from pretty much everyone in my life. In fact, everyone in my life, for most of it, for over 10 years. Um, at first, I thought I would get arrested for having the thoughts about kids. Um, and that guilt was made worse by going to a religious school where I was told that you can sin in your thoughts. Um, and when I got older and I did find out about OCD, I just thought no one would believe me if I told them because no one knew about it. It seemed so unfeasible. I was doubting it myself. So I just bottled it up. Now, in my mid-20s, I went through many, many months, almost a year of very effective exposure and response prevention therapy. Um, throughout that time, I didn't tell anyone in my family or my friends what I was going through. Um, and the relief that I felt from that therapy uh, made me feel empowered and made me feel like I wanted to start talking about this stuff. Um, <clears throat> so my secrecy changed when I was about 27 years old, which is now 12 years after the onset, <clears throat> excuse me, after the onset of my symptoms. And um, yeah, I just wanted to get my story out there. I was a junior writer at the time, and I decided to pitch a memoir story about basically what I've just told you to the Guardian newspaper. 
And to my surprise, they decided to print it in 2013. And um, at this point, I still hadn't told anyone in my family what I'd been through. <laughs> um, and the moment they found out was when that magazine hit the stands with my face on the front cover. Um, <laughs> I mean, I kind of had prepped them. I'd said, like, this is, I've got OCD, and this is going to be really shocking, but you, you, you know, wait, wait till you see this. Um, and it was a massive moment for me. It was, um, I was, I was kind of terrified that morning. I, I was, yeah, I was shaking. Um, but I never regretted it, and I still don't. <clears throat> So off the back of the Guardian article, I wrote a book called Pure um, about my life with OCD. Um, and it's about my search for a singular, unambiguous identity about how I tried desperately, compulsively, for years and years to <clears throat> establish a pure identity and about how I eventually found happiness by embracing uncertainty and greyness. Um, Pure is now getting made into a six-part fictional, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> a six-part fictional drama series for Channel 4. Um, and yeah, it still feels weird saying that. I don't think I've really come to terms with it. Um, it will be on your screens in autumn. Um, it's been a really incredible journey seeing my story reimagined like this. Um, it will be the first time ever this kind of OCD has been dramatized by a big TV network. And that's very exciting, but it's also a big responsibility for me. My bottom line from the start of the contract negotiations was that the portrayal of OCD had to be responsible. So uh, I got a professional OCD expert on board as consultant. And we've also been getting feedback on the scripts from Mind and from OCD Action, who've been amazing. Um, and they've helped us make the central character, who's based on me, really authentic and nuanced and sensitive. And we've really tried to work hard to make sure that Pure does justice to the seriousness of the condition. Um, Pure's probably not one you want to watch with your parents. Uh, it is about graphic intrusive sexual thoughts, and it is graphic. Um, and actually, if you've got that OCD theme, it's probably going to be quite triggering for you. It'd probably be quite triggering for me, ironically. Um, but it kind of felt important to not to sugarcoat the reality of it and to uh, you know, not present a kind of villa, like TV light version of the condition and to show that it is actually, uh, it can feel very real and very scary. Um, I believe that humor is a great healer and if we've done our job right, pure will also make you laugh. Um, I went down to the shoot the other day, uh, which was a really joyful experience. There was a crew of 60 people on Shoreditch High Street in Hackney, a whole cast of extras and stars talking freely about something that I'd kept secret for half my life. Um, and it, towards the end of the shoot, I got to watch as an intrusive thought was acted out by a couple of extras in front of me for the first time. And it was quite funny because the um, I heard the director shout, OK, intrusive thought, and then they got... <laughs> they. Uh, because they're shooting in public on location, they had to pull up these massive like privacy screens um, so that passers-by couldn't see. And then I heard the director say to one of the runners that he had to go and brief the salon down the end of the alley and say, um, yeah, there's going to be something quite graphic happening outside your window just to brief, brief your, uh, your customers. Um, and it was just a really fantastic moment to be able to laugh about something that I was once so ashamed about. Um, and to share it with other people and um, to feel the atmosphere of comfort and just complete lack of judgment and it was very healing. Um, today I also want to talk to you about a New York based charity called Intrusive Thoughts. Um, I'm on the board of that charity. Um, if you go to the website intrusivethoughts.org you'll find loads of information about OCD from experts and sufferers. Um, Intrusive Thoughts was founded by my friend, Aaron Harvey, and I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we came to know each other. Though Aaron grew up in coastal Florida, and I grew up on the outskirts of Birmingham, England, um, Aaron and I have been through strikingly similar experiences. We're similar ages. We both started having graphic intrusive thoughts as kids. We both kept our experiences secret for most of our adult lives. 
We'd both been driven to the brink of suicide by our thoughts. We both left our hometowns and ended up working in advertising, Aaron in New York, me in London, where he set up his own creative agency. Um, and when I published the Guardian article in 2013, one of the people who read it, who I didn't know at the time, was Aaron Harvey. Um, and he actually later told me that he used that article, he read it out loud, word for word, to his parents as a way of telling them the uh, secret he'd been keeping from everyone in his life for 20 years. Um, and Aaron cites that article as inspiring him to set up his charity, Intrusive Thoughts, which he then later asked me to be a part of. So now we're working together, and it's great. Um, I wanted to tell you that because it shows you how far-reaching OCD can be and how there are probably people all around the world right now experiencing something similar to what you're experiencing. And because Aaron is a good example of how OCD doesn't have to doom you to failure or misery, today Aaron still has OCD and is funny, intelligent, successful, and has loads of friends and has a great life. So it doesn't have to be a life sentence if anyone's in the grip of it right now. One of mine and Aaron's recent uh, pieces of work is the Intrusive Thoughts chatbot. Um, it's called PAX. Um, and it's, I don't know if you know what a chatbot is, but it's basically kind of like mimics a human, sits inside your Facebook chat um, and talks to you, and Pax talks to you about OCD, um, which kind of sounds weird. Um, I don't know, maybe try it out. Um, OCD Action, again, Olivia was super helpful um, in the development phase, helping me find test users. So it's been through lots of rigorous testing to find out. Um, well, for us, it was an opportunity for Aaron and I to go, well, when we were 15 and we didn't know anything about OCD, if we could have had the chance to sit down with someone and have them tell us exactly what we want to know in exactly the right order, what would they have said? So that's what PAX represents. Um, People often ask me, um, can you cure OCD? And um, I don't think there's any one answer to that question. Um, I think for some people, yes, that OCD goes away forever. And I know people in this room who were once suicidal with OCD and uh, are now completely OCD free. Um, for others, it will always be a part of their lives. 17 years after I first started experiencing intrusive thoughts, I still have repetitive intrusive sexual thoughts that caused me to become anxious. Thoughts like, what did that sensation in my body mean? What if I made the whole thing up as an elaborate story? What if I'm incapable of being happy in a relationship? I've learned the golden rule of OCD that compulsions make obsessions worse. And these days, if I fall into rituals like rumination or checking or reassurance, I notice quickly and resist the urge to continue. Nevertheless, Nothing can change the fact that before I had effective therapy, I spent more than a decade carving out associations in my brain, and those, association, that those associations are tenacious and powerful. So I still, found, I still find myself triggering sometimes. A sex scene in a movie can still give me a familiar feeling of tightness in my chest, an association between image and anxiety that I spent 10 years strengthening. The difference today is that I simply notice the anxiety and let it be there without questioning it or trying to push it out. Sometimes I might tackle it more aggressively and expose myself to my fear by saying something like, the fact I feel this right now after all these years could mean I don't really have OCD. And that makes me anxious, of course, but eventually it passes. So where once I would have spent hours Googling or checking my body for responses or interrogating my body for clues, I accept whatever my mind throws at me and I find, minutes later, that I'm at peace. I let the doubt be there, and I find it doesn't really ruffle my feathers, which is extraordinary, because I never thought I would get to that point. Last summer, I went on a 10-day insight meditation retreat. Uh, I lived in silence all day, all night, for 10 days, with nothing to do but pay attention to my own thoughts. A few years ago, this would have been hell on earth for me. I simply wouldn't have been able to do it. And at first, it was as hellish as, as I'd expected. My mind just would not shut up. But after three full days of returning my attention to my breath again and again, hundreds of times a day, letting the thoughts come and go, the thoughts started to feel less personal 
and I was able to let them come and go without passing judgment at all. As I got deeper into meditation, whole minutes would go by where I wasn't really thinking at all, and I never thought that was possible. Not for me, anyway. So, in answer to the question, am I cured? I think I'm about as cured as I'm ever likely to get, and I'm at peace with that. OCD at its worst can be truly devastating, but if I'd wish for you to bear one thing in mind today, it's that it is possible to have a good life while still managing repetitive, intrusive thoughts. And if you're in the grip of it right now, that's probably not a very nice prospect because you, you'll want to banish your obsessions forever and you can't ever imagine life, a life of which they'll be a part. Um, and who knows, maybe you will get there and maybe you will have an OCD-free life. Many do. My point is that whatever stage of OCD you're at, happiness is a possibility. I get messages from, strang uh, from strangers on a regular basis, and I don't always have the resources or knowledge to reply with anything helpful. And I do struggle with the guilt of that because um, I, do very, I do care very deeply about the community. Um, and I wish there was more I could do in support. Um, but these messages do mean the world to me. So before I wrap up, I want to share one with you. Um, it arrived by email on the morning that I published my Guardian article, nearly five years ago now, wow. Um, it was from a 53-year-old lady who later very kindly gave me permission to print it in my book. And she said, I showed my mother your article as I knew, although she might find it painful, she would want to know. I've often said to her that I felt that no one else shared my pain. She cried when she read it. I put my arms around her and told her she wasn't to blame and that I'd just been born in the wrong time, in a time when no one understood these things. I think that time is about to change. Um, so that morning when I was terrified and I knew that everyone in my life was reading my story for the first time, <laughs> that email just meant the world to me. Um, and there's sadness in it, but there's also optimism, and I share that optimism. I see teenagers in the audience today, and that gives me hope, because I couldn't have imagined a gathering like this when I was a teenager back in the year 2000. And it makes me wonder what this conference will look like in another 10 or 15 or 20 years. <clears throat> That's, uh, that's a really exciting thought for me um, because we're all part of this big awareness movement that's going to change people's lives. Some people came here today because they need information and some people need therapy, uh, some need medication, but one thing we definitely need is each other and I think we should feel very proud to be here today and I think it's going to be a wonderful day. Thank you. Time for just a couple of questions if anyone has any. There is a mic coming. Hi. Hello. Um, Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I, I myself experienced sexual intrusive thoughts uh -huh. um, back in 2012 when it all started. And now I'm here in London to do a PhD in linguistics about that topic and how people wow. use language um, in online forums and that kind of thing. And one of the things that I keep questioning myself is um, how, like, since it deals with sex sexuality, <clears throat> I'm always afraid how the LGBT community will react to that. Yeah. Because it's obviously a very sensitive topic because yeah. homosexuality was pathologized in the past and, mm -hmm. you know. So I'm just wondering how you deal with it, or if you ever had a comment like, oh, but aren't you being homophobic, or you know, yeah. that kind of thing. <coughs> this was um, actually like my biggest fear in telling my story, um, because, well, m two of my main obsessive themes throughout my life have been, um, I 
I had, but essentially feared that I was a paedophile when I was a teenager, and then later had broader doubts about my sexuality, so I could never figure out if I was gay or straight. And I, I was terrified that people would equate those two things and think that I was applying some kind of moral judgment to them or equating them morally. Um, because that wasn't the case at all. And I think, yes, I, I, I do fear that response, and I actually expect it, and I'm sure that will come up when the TV show comes out and there's more exposure. But I've been aware of it from the very start, so everyone in the production is aware that that's a really sensitive issue, and I think we can get around it by talking about it in a very nuanced way. So the way that I always think about it is that, well, you know, OCD, regardless of the theme, whether it's, um, you know, whether you have religious intrusive sexual thoughts or sexually intrusive thoughts, what's really going on is uncertainty and it's doubt, and that can kind of attach itself to anything. Um, and, you know, I think things like sexuality um, and religion, these are salient things in people's lives. They mean a lot to us, and that's why we obsess over them. Um, so, yeah. It's, it's, it's incredibly sensitive, um, but I think, you know, you're, you're going to study ling linguistics, maybe you can tell me next year, but I think we can get around it with words. Thank you, and great job. Thanks. Okay. Hello, thank Hi. you uh, for your honesty. I'm blown away. Um, and I suppose my question is actually one of a dramatic type because I was thinking that obviously the person that's going to be playing you will have to be sympathetic, nuanced, mm -hmm. authentic. And I wondered who they'd chosen or cast to play you in the series. Yeah, so we've, um, the, so it's the, they pick up my story when I was 24, um, when I first moved to London. And the girl that they've cast is an unknown. This is her first big role. So she's been, she's been cast alongside some, some bigger actors. We've poached half the cast of Black Mirror, which is great. Um, but she herself, she's an unknown. And this is a massive role for her. And um, you know, the, the, the production saw 100 girls, and she was just absolutely a standout. She just had this, she was, she's just so natural. And she just had a real emotional integrity. Um, she just had that star quality and she gets it, you know, she gets it. Um, and we, yeah, we, we cast her for that reason because she's got real depth. So I'm excited for you guys to see her in action. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.